picking up about uh, verse 9 is where we left off when the bell called us last time. We go back just a little bit in chapter 2 and talk about a couple of things just sort of help tie us together as we begin this morning. But as we start their class, let's, let's bow and have a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We're thankful that you've given us the things that we have need of and, and far more than that. And we're especially mindful of the blessings that come through Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that we'll never forget the sacrifice that he made for us, uh, that he had the willingness to come here to, to love us and to uh, endure the death upon the cross that uh, we might have hope of life eternal. We pray, Father, that we will understand thy will for us, that we'll embrace it, that we'll engage in it every day of our lives and live faithfully such that one day heaven can be our home. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us this morning as we study. Help us to have understanding of those things that are discussed. Help us, Father, to always strive to, to know and do thy will. We realize, Father, that many times we fall short of what you would have us to do, and we pray that you'll forgive us of our sins, help us to always have a penitent heart and mind, that uh, we'll always want to be doing those things that bring honor and glory to thy name. We're thankful for this congregation. We're thankful for um, what uh, we can accomplish in this area, and we pray that we'll have the uh, great intent to do more and more as we grow together closer to one another. We pray, Father, that you will be with those that we're aware of this congregation that are suffering, uh, some due to illness, some due to uh, long-term uh, health issues, some uh, due to surgeries, uh, some because of loss of loved ones. And we pray, Father, that you bless us, help us to grow together, help us to comfort and encourage one another. Continue with us through this day of worship. May we worship in a manner that's well pleasing to thy sight. May we bring honor and glory to thy name in the way we conduct ourselves. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. If you remember uh, Paul instructing Timothy in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he, he said to, uh, to provide uh, honor to those who are in authority. Uh, that you pray for them, you make uh, uh, supplications for them, giving the thanks. He said, do it for all men, but especially, he says, for kings and those who are in authority, uh, that we may have a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. He said, that's a good and acceptable thing, something that we should be doing. And then he goes on really to give an explanation of that. It's God's intent, verse 4. It's God's intent that who would be saved? All men. And we can't, um, we can't stress that enough that the idea here that he's trying to say is that we're, we're supposed to pray for all men. We're supposed to uh, try to uh, encourage everyone we come in contact with through our actions or through our words to want to live the Christian life. To convey that to them. And uh, he goes on to say there's one God, there's one mediator, that's Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is the way that it's done. Um, this is the truth. And um, it's, it's, um, it's something that hopefully men and women will open their eyes to. That there is one way that we can lay hold on salvation. It has to come through Jesus Christ. And it has to be the way that God has prescribed it. And not something that somebody's come up with, not something that somebody has uh, uh, tinkered with or they've uh, changed in some way, but the way that God intended it. Now, he goes on to say that Christ has given himself a ransom, uh, that, that these things can take place. And he says, because of this, he says, I'm a preacher uh, to the Gentiles and I'm going to speak the truth and uh, this is what uh, I, I intend to do and I'm going to do it in, in, in faith and verity and he says I will therefore that men pray everywhere 
lifting up holy hands. Now, the idea here is the idea that if you are lifting up holy hands, that is totally um, with the understanding of what kind of life you have to live. Uh, in other words, he, his, it's his intent and his teaching to Timothy here. He says, um, this, the, when you approach God, you don't approach God as saying, God, I, I've done everything I've wanted to do. Not saying this out loud, but just in the back of your mind. I've lived life the way I want to live it, and I've done things the way I want it. But I want you to listen to my prayers. If we're going to approach God, we've got to approach God with holy hands. And that's, that's not a washing like it was in the Old Testament. When the priest had to go into the temple, they would wash their hands. But it's the idea, certainly, that if we approach God, we've got to approach God cleansed and in a relationship that is acceptable to him. We can't work with God on our terms. Well, God, I know I'm not trying that hard or I'm not doing what I should be doing, and I know that, but I still want you to listen to me. The idea here is, the, is that we have ourselves in a right relationship with God, and we are approaching him with holy hands. That doesn't mean washed hands. That means our conduct and our lives are representative of what we should be. And, and that's serious. That's not something that you take as, as trivial or uh, of, of very little value. But when you start uh, understanding that and you know what you need to do to com come in line with what God has told us to do and how we conduct ourselves, that has a significance. And we understand that we don't got, approach God in some trivial manner, but we approach God with holy hands. That's the intent here that Paul's trying to tell Timothy. Uh, I want men to be a certain way. And that means that we have responsibilities. Now, <clears throat> today's society, uh, in a big part, wants to say, I don't really want any responsibility. I don't want to do, I want to do what I want to do. But if we're going to be children of God, we accept the responsibility of becoming spiritual men. And, and that, <clears throat> that is something that is uh, a challenge. It's something that we have to uh, embrace and we have to work at. And that's the idea he's talking about here. When you approach God, you approach God with holy hands, with lives where you have dedicated and made your decisions to serve God. And so that, that is some, some significance there. He says, do this by lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And um, this is how we should approach God. And we were starting verse 9 when the, the bell caused a couple weeks ago. But in like manner, the women have responsibilities also. There are certain things that, that they need to, to embrace and become uh, in character so that they will be the kind of people that God wants them to be. And these are not things that the men say, yeah, you women get in line. That's, that's, not, that's not what this is about. And if, if we have the attitude of, uh, yeah, the, I like what the Bible says, put the women in the right place. That's, that's not uh, what this is saying. What this is saying is you have responsibilities also. You have responsibilities that you need to embrace and and to make part of your life, make your character. And here's what he talks about. He says, in like manner, after these men are lifting up holy hands, which means their lives are uh, in compliance with what God wants them to be, and not just outwardly, but inwardly, uh, so that their spirit has been changed. But in like manner also, women adorn themselves in modest apparel. I know that's a touchy subject. But that's not me saying it. It's not somebody in the pulpit saying it when they speak it. It is coming from the word of God. And so the, the, even back in the time of Timothy and Paul, obviously there are, there's the possibility and there was desire on, on worldly women to present themselves uh, in such a way that it was not appropriate. Now that's, that's one thing, the way I look at modest apparel. 
It's the idea of appropriateness. Is it appropriate for me to wear this? Is it appropriate for, appropriate for me to be in public in this? Is it appropriate for me um, to be in, a, in, a, in some appearance in some way like this? And that's the question you have to ask, your, have to ask yourself. It's not a matter of uh, what's society doing. It's not a matter of what's the latest fashion, but it's a matter of what is God's will. And the whole idea he's talking here as we talk about men and women is, are you going to conform to the word of God? Are you going to change your character to be who you need to be? And that's, that's what he's talking about here. Women should adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness um, and sobriety. Be serious-minded about what you're doing. Don't be somebody who is, you know, just um, silly and not taking care of their business. That's the idea here. But with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided or broided hair or braided hair, uh, or gold or pearls or costly array. Not dressing yourself up so that you draw attention to yourself. Now, I, I know that's the way the world is today. You know, it's like you hear some people talk about it. The fashion people are always wanting to accentuate uh, the formliness uh, of, of a female, trying to draw attention to her. You know, we have beauty pageants to do that. We do a lot of things to draw attention to the female body. And it's by design because people that are <clears throat> caught up in that recognize that that is uh, tantalizing. It is appealing in some ways. And so they can encourage that. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's hard for us to be in this world that we live in many times because of the influences on every hand of what we're seeing. But we have to step back and say, is this what God wants for me? And uh, if you can pull yourself away from the world, and if you have people who pull themselves away from the world, then they see the real beauty of people, not their outward appearance. And, and I'm convinced that the reason that we have so many failed marriages is because we don't teach our kids that marriage is about other than the physical attraction. Because what happens is in a few years, those things are going to fade us. They're going to leave us. You know, our skin gets really uh, non-elastic. I mean, it doesn't stick to our bodies like it used to, start sagging a little bit. Our faces over time have wrinkles. Um, you know, our bones don't want to bend like they used to. Those things that are uh, uh, enticing in their appearance from a personal standpoint are going to go away. And this is something that we need to understand. That's not what marriage and love is based on. We need to be looking for the beauty within people. And I just, personally, my experience is as, we, as I go through life, I see more of the beauty within people. Um, maybe it's just because I'm getting older. But I don't see, you know, this, this person from a, uh, a worldly enticing standpoint. I mean, it's, it's apparent when people try to dress and... and, and uh, Take after the ways of the world. But the real beauty of people is in knowing their character and knowing what they stand for. And that's where we need to put our emphasis. Not in what we do external, but what we do internal. And so he says, uh, don't, don't put these things on. Don't follow the ways of the world, the allurements of the world. Uh, <clears throat> but he says... Uh, he says, that which becometh women professing godliness, that's what the emphasis would be. I, I am here on earth as a, as a child of God, in this case we're talking about women, to profess godliness. Now how do you do that if you draw attention to yourself and your physical appearance? I don't think you can do that. You're going to have to do it, he says, and here's how he gives us the key here. And... Um, in verse 10, 
You're going to do it with good works. Now, we talked about this several weeks back. If you look at the number of times that I know Paul does, and I, Peter has done it too, emphasizes what we ought to be about. James talked about this some. We're about works. Now, do works save us? No. But works demonstrate our character. Don't you understand that? Works emphasize our character. Now, it, we're not talking about things as we're going to have something up here at the church building on such and such day. Y'all need to come up here and be a part of it. Oh, everybody comes in there. We do a good work. That's not what we're talking about, although that, that's lumped in there. What we're talking about is what you do on a daily basis to demonstrate your character to other people. That's helping them. That's being the, the courteous and kind person that you need to be when things are not easy, when things are difficult. And we need to be people who are not as frustrated as the world is when things don't go their way. If we act just like the world, then we're no different than the world. And so when things don't go our way as a Christian, we need to have some tolerance and some kindness. And we need to look at, you know, what, what we're supposed to be about. But women professing godliness are going to be involved in good works. Good works. And those things are not things that have to have a lot of attention to them. It can be a kind word. It can be baking something for somebody. It can be sending a card. There are so many things that we can do that don't have to draw attention to ourselves that are good things that we know we should be doing. So this is a kind of, of character he talks about that men and women ought to have. Now he goes further as he talks about women and he says women need to learn in silence let women learn in silence uh, in, in other words quietness and they do that with all subjection now I think sometimes especially as young people we have the misperception that nobody's going to tell me what to do have you ever run across young people like that Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, guess what? Somebody's always going to tell you what to do. Somebody is always going to tell you what to do. We are always subject to somebody. And that's just the way the world is. And if we think we can live in the world without being subject to somebody, we're going to have some, uh, some learning moments. So we need to understand that that's the way it's going to be. Now, this is God's will. This is not uh, men getting together and deciding, well, women shouldn't uh, talk in the church or they should be silent in the church and, and on and on, those kind of things. But he says, let a woman learn in silence. Let her learn in silence. If there are things she wants to know, and uh, <clears throat> one of the writers says, let them learn at home. Um, but the idea here is that there's not going to be disruption in the conduct of uh, assemblies together, especially as talked about in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, uh, where there were those who had abilities, and, uh, and Paul says there that, uh, that women need to be silent and uh, not, not speak up. So this is something that should be said. Now we're talking here about the, the, the worship service. In a classroom setting where you have a teacher and the teacher is asking for comments, it's certainly appropriate for, for a woman to answer a question because that would be under subjection of the teacher. That's fine. But in a worship service, uh, that's to be totally in silence. Uh, and that doesn't mean you can't sing. Uh, we're talking about, here again, being subject to the authority that's there. And so it says, let a woman be learn in silence with all subjection uh, I suffer not a woman to teach and that is would be teaching in terms to usurp authority over men uh, nor to usurp authority over the man he says but to be in silence and so we we understand that um, that's not today's world uh, today's world women take a lot of leading positions and uh, if they have the talent 
That's just the way it is. But in the church, it's not that way. And so we need to understand that. It's not a matter of us getting together and saying, well, you know, that's, that's old stuff. And we don't think that's appropriate anymore. And so we think we ought to have women involved. And there have been a lot of people who have made those decisions, even within, I would say, unfaithful congregations of the body of Christ. They would take issue with that, but I'm going to say that that's the case because if you're faithful, you're serving God. You're doing what the Bible says. If you're unfaithful, you're coming up and you're trying to interject man's ideas into the worship service. So if I have a woman that waits on the table or leads singing or is an elder, that's totally in contrary to the word of God. So we need to understand these things and, and how God intends them to be. And it's not hey, you know, I'm pushing you down, I'm suppressing you. This is what God intends and what is taught by inspired apostles. So, a woman is not supposed to teach or use the authority of the man, but to be in silence. And then he gives an example for Adam was first formed, then Eve, that man has that preeminence with God. Not to the extent that, uh, you know, a woman is lesser of a human being, but that that was God's plan and intention. Man was formed first, then Eve. Uh, Adam was formed, formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but Eve was, and Eve caused the uh, sin to progress and transgress, uh, leading to Adam's transgression also. Notwithstanding, he says, she shall be saved in childbearing uh, if they continue in faith and love and holiness and sobriety. And that to me is somewhat of a serious statement. It's not just the idea of, of childbearing is going to save woman. Certainly men aren't going to bear children, right? So we're talking here about the women, but it's not just that childbearing is going to save them, but what does he say? Saved in childbearing if what? If they continue in faith and in charity or love and holiness with sobriety. So there's salvation available just like there is with mankind or men. There's, there is salvation to the women. And here's the things that are going to be a part of, should be a part of their lives to, to lay hold of salvation. You can't just say, well, I've had a few children, I'm going to be saved, you know. You can't say, um, I'm a baptized believer, but I'm not really conducting myself the way I should, according to God's will. That's not certainly not conducive to salvation. But here he gives the idea that there is salvation that's going to take place even because of the transgression, aligning ourselves and doing what God has asked us to do. So, you know, I don't want to belabor that, but this is what the scriptures teach, and this is what we're inclined and required to embrace if we're going to be following God's will. And, and godly women understand that. I don't think that's really an issue. Okay, so then he transitions as, we, as he's writing this letter to Timothy. We've talked about what all Timothy's got to do. He's got to... Uh, uh, combat false teachers. He's got to uh, sort of bolster those who are part of the, the family of God. And so he continues now. He talked about women, uh, men, women, and now he's going to address uh, two offices that are part of the makeup of the church. And first of all, he talks about elders. And we're not going to spend a lot of time with this because we've, we've had plenty of lessons on elders and deacons, but just to sort of read over this and we'll touch on some few things that that will um, help to refresh our memory of what uh, the requirements are and what's necessary. This is a true saying. This is, is, it has all value. It has, has merit that if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. It is a good work. That means what is being done there is good. It's what God wants. What he left out of this passage is, is it's a difficult work. And I don't know why I didn't say that, because it is. Um, 
I don't know how else to say that. If you desire that office, it's a good work. But if someone thinks that, as we read later on here, the novice may want that office because it may be something he can puff his chest out and say, look, it may look what I've done or look what I'm doing or look who I am. That's not part of the office. And it is a difficult work because there's so many things that um, have to be dealt with, have to be addressed. And there's no way you know that until you are actually a part of it. Um, it amazes me. But when Paul says that, you know, uh, the, the times that uh, he was beaten and he was shipwrecked and, and he was naked and he was in peril, and he goes through that long list of what he, what he has had to endure, and then he says, besides all that, what? The constant concern of all the churches. And that's what you don't necessarily understand. Um, if you take a congregation this size, and let's say just ballpark, it's made up of 300 members, then <clears throat> you have men who try to lead that, that group who have the care and the constant concern uh, uh, of all the members. And not only that, those things that are outside. I mean, there's, there's always, uh, are there families in the community that need some kind of assistance? Are we, are we doing enough with the mission work? Um, and it just goes on and on. You gotta maintain the facilities that you have. And, and it just, all of that has to be addressed. And it's not an easy task because it's never ending. It's always something that comes up. And it's a good work, but it's a difficult work. And if you want to be a bishop, a bishop then must be someone who's without reproach, a blameless person, such that no one outside could say, well, you know, you, you're not really this character. You're not really this person. You don't uh, conduct yourself properly when, I'm, when I've seen you, you know, those kind of things. Um, have to be very careful with the character and how you exhibit your, your life. Husband of one wife, um, vigilant, constantly watching, um, has, to, has to see uh, what <clears throat> the congregations are being fed spiritually, make sure that there's not any false teaching that's coming in. Uh, those kind of things have to be taken care of. Uh, to be sober-minded, um, obviously serious about what's going on, uh, taking care of a, a congregation, is a serious thing and should not be taken lightly. I uh, must have good, good behavior, given to hospitality, uh, apt to teach, able to teach, uh, to be able to know what the scriptures say and uh, to be able to present those to someone if, if the need arises or the occasion arises. Um, not given to wine. Uh, we could go into all that, but uh, I think everyone understands that uh, New Testament Times, they had no way of uh, uh, maintaining uh, anything with refrigeration. Um, the um, the water was uh, usually, in a lot of cases, not uh, able to be uh, taken by itself because of all the the things that were in it, and it was not clean, pure water. Um, they, of course, had. Uh, um, Binds uh, full of grapes, and those were used to make drink. Now, wine used in the New Testament has the same meaning for freshly squeezed juice as it some that's been setting for, for several days. And so you need to understand that there is um, something that needs to be evaluated in terms of the scriptures with your eyes and ears open, your hearts, uh, about what we should be doing. And this should not be something that we um, use and try to make an arguing point because it's just not conducive with what we ought to do with the scriptures. And so, you know, you see here in this particular passage is not given to wine. Now look it up at what he says about the, the deacon uh, in uh, 
verse 8, he says, not given to much wine. So, so people will take that and they'll say, well, you know, some of that wine was intoxicating or, or had alcohol content. So basically, if I'm a deacon, I can drink a little bit. It looks to me like an elder can't. Not, he says here, uh, not given to wine, which would be an, in, in, an inclination to, to it. But then we have deacon says, don't drink too much wine. So we, we use those arguments. We say, well, that says we can drink a little bit. We just need to be open-minded about what the scriptures intend. And um, obviously, he says here that uh, the idea of not giving to wine, the American Standard Version says no brawler. Now, he talks about brawling a little bit later, but the idea here is you're always under control, always under control. And uh, so we just need to be really careful about trying to take the scriptures and twist them to what we wanted to say. So uh, not a brawler, not covetous, not wanting a uh, lover, lover of money or wanting things. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. I think we understand what that means. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the, the church of God? Not a novice, not somebody who is not experienced, who hasn't had uh, the trials and the tribulations of the world and had to work through them. Um, unless it says, uh, unless he be lifted up with pride, fall into the condemnation of the devil. So someone who is an elder, it can't be someone who is um, looking for personal gain of any way or any shape because you know, some, somewhere in the world, someone would try to influence him. Uh, so, someone who's not a novice must have a good report of them that are without, those who are outside the body of Christ, that his character is, uh, is, is sound. He's not uh, hypocritical in what he does with his life, lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. And then likewise, must be the deacons must be grave. Here again, we talk about the idea of seriousness, um, not double-tongued. Uh, we know what we, we usually use the terminology, talk out of both sides of your mouth. You don't say something to one person, turn around and say something to the other that's totally different. Not double-tongued, not, not split based on the occasion. To be consistent in, in what you do. Not giving to much wine, not gritty, greedy of filthy lucre, um, holding the mystery of the faith in a good, pure conscience. Um, the seriousness of understanding what we're trying to accomplish in that office and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, it, it's a serious thing. And it says, let these also first be proved. Uh, just as the, the elder doesn't need to be a novice, he needs to have experience. Here's the idea of conveying that let's, let's see if there are people that have demonstrated to us within a local congregation that they are workers, that they are servants. Let's, let us, let's know that before we actually um, put them in a position as being deacons. Let them first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now, what's so important is uh, the idea that's about to follow in verse 11. Now, you notice that he didn't talk about this when he talked about the office of an elder. What's the importance of the women in a person's life conducting themselves a certain way? That's obvious. Uh, it's not like, well, the, the elders' wives don't really need to conduct themselves a certain way. But the deacons do. That's not what the idea is here. And it's pretty obvious that if a man, to be an elder, and to have the character and the, the nature that an elder is supposed to have, his wife has to be uh, someone that is without reproach as well. Someone who is not um, uh, carrying on two lives are hypocritical. Those kind of things uh, are understood as we talk about the elder. 
for the deacon, let the deacons, uh, even so their wives, uh, in the same manner as the, the, the characteristics of the kind of person that they need to be, a true character, a serious-minded, um, dedicated to what their purpose is. The woman, he says here, or in like manner, must be grave, not slanderers. Um, that's not talking about people. And uh, some we all need to be careful about. If I'm talking to you about somebody and I'm telling you the facts of the situation, that's fine. But if I start telling you things that I want to just try to juice it up a little bit about, I'm wrong. I don't need to be talking like that. Um, if I'm talking about somebody and I'm ta trying to tell you that, uh, what's going on in their lives, for example, and, and I'm telling you the truth, that's fine if that's something that needs to be known. But when I start talking about people and trying to talk bad about them, then that's not appropriate. So the idea here of not slandering people and also sober, faithful in all things. Pretty stringent requirements uh, for the wives of deacons. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. If we are conducting ourselves the way we need to be, especially someone who is singled out or set apart for, for service uh, for the, the local church, the body, um, then it's something that they should feel well about. Not, not prideful, but they should have boldness in terms of uh, recognizing that they've, they're doing what they should be doing in Christ Jesus. And so uh, Paul says, I write these things unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, why did I write these things? What does he say? So you know how you ought to behave yourself. It's almost like a father writing to a son, right? And of course, we talked about the fact that Paul views uh, Timothy as his son, in the faith. And so he writes these things telling him how he ought to behave and how he's going to have to deal with things that other people ought to be about. And he says, if I tarry long, um, I've written these things unto you so that you know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. And that's a That's a statement that, I mean, we could have several lessons on. We could certainly be a good sermon topic for the, from the pulpit. How do you behave yourself in the house of God? And we're not talking about how do you come into the assembly? How do you come on the Lord's Day and behave yourself? We're talking about how you ought to behave as you are a part of the family of God. You're in the house of God uh, in the sense that we are his. We are part of the body. And he says, these are things that tell you how you ought to behave yourself. It's not like, Timothy, when you get ready to go get together on the first day of the week, let me tell you how you ought to dress and act and conduct yourself. Well, that'd be part of it. But the idea here is, how do you behave yourself all the time? And folks, you can't turn on and off Christianity. If you do, you've missed the point of what the scriptures teach. And you're living a hypocritical life. You need to be the same wherever you are. And that's the idea. How do you behave yourself? in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's one of those things that you just can't get around. You cannot get over. He's telling him that this is the very foundational thing of what your life is about. Your life is about how to conduct yourself 
in every aspect of your life, in every occasion, in every circumstance you find yourself in, in every location, because you are part of the house of God. And he goes on to say, this is the church of the living God. This is not something, I, I mean, I have heard people say, and I'm sure you have too, I have heard people say and, and do things in their lives, be a part of man-made organizations which they treated just as significant as being part of the body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying these people were all members of the, the true body, but they were religious, and their idea was, well, I'm just trying to do good things, so over here we're doing good things, and over here we're doing good things. They're basically the same. There's no way you can equate anything we do on this earth that men have derived or have created or are part of other than the body of Christ that has this significance. You are part of the church of the living God. Now, I don't know how to make that have the importance it should have. You are a member of the church of the living God. And I know sometimes in this world, people tell us that God is dead. Uh, people will throw out to us, well, where is this God? You know, we don't see him. We don't know that he really exists. And even in the times of Timothy and Paul, God did not physically evidence himself unto them. But he's the God. He's the living God. And he hasn't died from the time that this was written to the present age that we're in. Nor will he die. He is the living God. He is almighty. And to, to drive home to Timothy that you are a member of the church of the living God that should sort of rattle us a little bit. That should shake us a little bit to realize that we are part of that and how we ought to conduct ourselves. It's the pillar in the ground of truth. It is the foundational truth. Nothing else is truth if it's not built on the truth of what God has said. And it is something that that verse should jump out at us and shake us and rattle us to realize the importance of what it means to be part of the church. And he says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That, that's just in itself, is just unbelievable topic. The mystery of godliness. That the fact that there is a way, there is a mechanism, there is a process that we can go through to be like God. That we can be considered his children. That we can take on the character of his son Jesus Christ. And that is our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is to be like him. And if we're going to be like him, we talked earlier about good works. Is it going to be difficult for us to be involved in good works? It's our second nature. If we're like Christ, we cannot go throughout this life without doing good works because that's what he was about. Even in the midst of his busy ministry, he always had time to do good works. That was just his character. And that's the character that we take on. But the mystery of godliness, how do you, how do you understand that? How do you understand that God's allowed us to be part of something that makes us more like him. That's an amazing mystery. And look at what it says here. As he talks about Christ, and this, this passage is, I, I'd memorize this passage. This, is, this passage is significant. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the, in the flesh, we know that in John 1, 1, 1 John 1, Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. 
He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Everything that he did was to do the will of the Father, and we know by at least two occasions where we have the Spirit involved in saying, this is my Son, justified in the Spirit. And of course we know that includes doing what he needed to do to die on the cross. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. We'll touch on this a little bit more next week, but that, that is an amazing verse, one that certainly merits us putting that in our memories. Thanks for being here.